In my chimes, maybe it's you Can't understand why the touch of your hand Makes my heart take off for the sky Can't help wondering why Maybe it's you Why buy up all those heart-shaped balloons Sooner or later they pop Why throw those coins in the fountain they only go kerplop Maybe I'm crazy, I'm picking out daisies To see if you love me or not Maybe you love me a lot, let's see if it's true Got three more to go and I'll know Maybe it's you Time dressing up to the nines when I know that it'll do fine. Someone's ringing my chimes, maybe it's you. I can't understand why the touch of your hand makes my heart take off for the sky. Can't help wondering why, maybe it's you. Why buy up all those heart shaped balloons? Sooner or later they pop Why throw those coins in the fountain They only go kerplop Maybe I'm crazy I'm picking out daisies To see if you love me or not Maybe you love me a lot Let's see if it's true
walk into the room My head begins to spin I don't know where I'm going Or where on earth I've been I'm on the edge of falling For love I never knew I'm so close to getting close to you When my love song starts to play Do you hear its theme? Are we just a kiss away? Or is this just a dream? Good things come to those who wait How I hope it's true I'm so close to getting close So close to getting close So close to getting close to you Yeah, can you hear me? Awesome. How you doing? Pretty good. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be fine. What's up? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could do that. Can't hear me. Ha! Always have one blooper per show. Hey, everybody in the chat. I'm here with Hard Bastard. Say hey again. That way everybody knows. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, we're going to talk about immigration and DACA. Okay, Mariel, you know I have at least one blooper per stream. It, it, it works <laughs> that way all the time. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we're going to probably get into, uh, for those of you that watch the State of the Union address, our fair shit lord in chief, as I love to call him, um, <laughs> mentioned the quote unquote four pillars of immigration, um, which, which I thought personally was a um, <clears throat> troll as far as, you know, Islam and stuff was concerned, just kind of a parody mm -hmm. of that, which I thought was funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you got it. I mean, people love him or hate him. He's our president, and as I love to call him, after seeing his posts on Twitter, our shit lord in chief. Oh yeah, he's definitely <laughs> he definitely trolls people. Uh, I enjoy it. Like apparently, I mean, I've always followed politics, but apparently, it's like politically incorrect for a president to act the way he does but it makes me laugh so i mean i like it oh it does it's absolutely unpresidential but it's so down to earth the people that voted for him are probably like yep that's why we voted for him that's why yeah we, you know so um all right so it says here out of the rpc senate.gov site four pillars the trump administration um, immigration plan so we're starting out with the key takeaways on march 5th work authorizations may begin to expire for the 690,000 recipients of deferred action for childhood arrivals or daca two courts have already said that he can't do that 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 expiration date can't happen mm -hmm. um the trump administration last month released a framework for legislation to provide legal status and a pathway to citizenship for an estimated 1.8 people eligible for 1.8 million people eligible for daca rather and the framework would also strengthen border security eliminate the diversity visa program and limit family-sponsored immigration to spouses and minor children of citizens and green card holders. What gets me here is I don't see any mention of the merit system they've been talking about. No, and then, you know, what's interesting is I've, I've heard that the 1.8 could even be expanded to up to like 4 million. Uh, and I think this was one of the things that was interesting that a, a lot of the conservatives were upset about this because they didn't want amnesty granted to Ill illegal uh, immigrants. Uh, but then also when you have Democrats who are just not going to negotiate whatsoever because th they're not in any way willing to have any sort of reform. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very interesting move that Trump made that I think it's almost like he knew that the Democrats were going to not negotiate, but now he's put them in a bad spot because you have all of these people that could potentially be given a one-time amnesty. And uh, I think most human beings, when you break it down, are generally selfish. So I think a lot of the people in the DACA program, if the Democrats don't come through, they're going to be upset and that could hurt the uh, the base of the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. And you know they like to protect their voter base no matter what it takes. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. It says on September 5th, 2017, DHS announced that it would no longer accept new applications for DACA relief effective immediately. DACA enrollee enrollees would be able to work until their two-year work authorization expires. People whose work authorizations were set to expire before March 5th, 2018, six months from the announcement, were allowed to apply for a two-year renewal until October 5th of 2017. So it's not like they don't have time, or they didn't have time. Yeah, I, the media made it sound like the, de the deportations were going to start almost immediately. Um, but it, that doesn't seem to be the case. And and I, I would make the argument that, like, I, I definitely understand Democrats disagreeing with what Trump is putting forward, but that they won't even negotiate is crazy to me. Um, because I, I think that it's fine if people are, are liberal and they want to say, well, we, we would like the, uh, I don't know, the lottery program, for example. Yeah. And, and try to come up with, or, you know, if they have a problem with the funding for the, for the wall or whatever. But to just walk away, I, I, I just, I don't know how they're going to try to sell that to people. That if they're supposed to represent, if you're under the DACA program and Democrats are supposed to rep, be representing you because they're constantly acting as if they are, are, are speaking for them. And you know that they wouldn't even negotiate. They wouldn't even give it a chance. That's, that's just not, I don't see how that's a good political move uh, on their behalf. Yeah, it, it, to me it isn't. I mean, it's like they're shooting themselves in the foot with um, yeah. what they're doing and their lack of negotiation because 
even before he was elected president, he said he would put forth an idea and he was more than willing to sit down and negotiate to come up with some sort of, you know, agreement for the things that he wanted done in his first four years of office. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a president that's willing to work for, with you, not stand there and, you know, pound his fist and go, it's got to be my way or the highway or uh, the indomitable pen that doesn't run out of ink in the endless, you know, executive orders. Um, it's, it's like, why, why don't you guys just sit down and, and just talk to him? I mean, I'm sure you guys could come up with something. You just have to sit down and talk and negotiate, and they don't want to do that. Yeah, I think it's the Trump derangement syndrome. Like, because I think if this was any other Republican president, and they offered 1.8 to 4 million uh, illegal immigrants to be amnestied, I mean, that is a massive, I think, a massive good faith move. Um, I mean, certainly it's also strategic because he knows th that they're ridiculous and and they're not going to go for it. But um, it's just uh, it, it surprised me. I really I thought it would be much more. Uh, uh, restrictive um, because even in the stuff we're going to get into in regards to like the um, whether it's the lottery or whatever yeah. um, when you compare the the corporate media narrative on it and then what it actually says it's like th they're in two completely different worlds oh yeah most definitely and you know the one thing that a lot of the lefts don't even want to acknowledge good evening G Bronner thanks for showing up is the fact that the executive, the order that Obama signed was completely circumventing the Constitution. There were no checks yeah. and balances when he wrote in DACA. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and they constantly want to overlook the fact that they're defending something that is wholly unconstitutional. Yeah, I mean, they could, they could make the argument that they should just get rid of the program. Like they could make that argument. It would be a legal. It would be a completely constitutional argument to say we're forget forget it. We're not doing it. We're not doing it at all. Obama was wrong for doing it, and they're not doing that. They're they're willing to. Um, I, I mean, it, the number is incredible. I, I just really, I, it's a it was a very good move uh, by Trump because I think this makes Democrats look bad on all sides. Oh yeah, I completely and totally agree. Um, and I saw a Malachite, so hi, thanks for popping in. Um, pillar one, border security. The framework would strengthen border security by creating a $25 billion trust fund for the border wall system, ports of entry slash exit, and northern border improvements. Okay. So I have no problem if people want to, uh, or Democrats or whatever, if, you, if they want to negotiate this price down, that's fine. That's a lot of money. I didn't, I don't really care about the wall. I care about the border being secure. If you have to do it through the wall, that's fine. Um, I think right now, just how they're enforcing, they're actually enforcing uh, the laws in the country. I think that's part of the reason that, that Ill, Ill, illegal immigration is down. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know, like, it, it really depends. Uh, some people, I think, view the wall as more of, like, symbolic, and that's one of the reasons uh, that they like it. What's your take on the wall? Is it, like, important to you, or are you just, like, either way? Well, as long as, long as we can secure the border. If we can, yeah. you know, spare the extra expense of the wall and still keep the border secure, I'm, sure. I'm you know, I'm happy with that. But if they don't see any other way of keeping all these um, illegal aliens out then building the wall, then, you know, the wall's going to have to be built because the border is undermanned. Yeah. You know, grossly undermanned. Yeah, I mean, there were even the issues, I think, when Obama was in office where he was telling people to stand down. He was telling border agents to stand down under certain circumstances. I mean, it wasn't wholesale like every area. But um, now I, I've also heard people make the argument that you could, it would be more... Um, like financially feasible to use like drones and, and, and stuff like that. The, the issue I have with that though is like any time, any kind of mass surveillance like that, I, I'm always kind of uh, very hesitant, particularly if it's the government. I'm very hesitant to act, to advocate for something like that. So, and, and you know, it's, it's not affecting me at least materially that I can that I can see as far as like this funding, um, which I would argue uh, he has from the beginning 
put out three separate um, possible plans on how Mexico would pay for it. And one of them was never Mexico paying up front because I don't even think Mexico would be able to even handle an upfront bill like that of whatever it is, 25 billion. Yeah. Uh, so I do think it's plausible that Mexico pays for it. If, if Mexico doesn't pay for it, then I would, I would definitely view that as a negative mark. But I think that we're not going to know until the wall goes up and then um, Trump comes through with whatever aspect of, of payment from Mexico uh, that, that he was uh, planning on. But it's always been on, on his uh, campaign website. Oh, yeah. I mean, to make, I mean, he's always been adamant that Mexico should pay for the wall. When mm -hmm. it's, it's not only Mexicans that are crossing the border. It's San Salvador, Guatemalans, people from South America. You know, all those people are trying to flee all of their countries and come here because of what's going on in their countries, especially Venezuela, Guatemala, San yeah. Salvador, Mexico, you know, places like that. And I don't blame them, but I mean, there are legal sure. ways that they can come here. Yeah, it's not an issue. Like, I, it's just because look, it's it's a diff it's a difficult subject, particularly if you're in their shoes. I mean, they they have, in some cases, there's horrible conditions. I understand why people uh, try to do it. The problem is like you can't. This is one of those areas that like you can't show weakness if you're America you can't show weakness of like okay we'll we'll kind of let it slide so just sneak in because there's a lot of people and there's not enough resources for everybody so like in a perfect world yeah you could let everyone in and and it would be great but that's just not reality um and I, I just don't believe that that it's moral to sacrifice the um the well-being of your citizens who are already here, including legal immigrants, um, which are negatively affected by illegal uh, immigration. I just, I just, I don't think it's moral to sacrifice uh, the well-being of your citizens that are already here to let people in uh, illegally. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that because I mean, my parents came legally from Cuba. They immigrated. They became naturalized citizens and stuff, and they. They're more than happy that they are here and they got the opportunities they did. And sure. I called my mom the other day and I told her that I had jury duty. And she goes, well, I was able to do my civic duty at least twice in my lifetime so far. Mm -hmm. So you need to do yours. I went, <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, the mentality is way different from people that yeah. have immigrated here legally. They love to be here. They want to do anything they can to support the country. And I grew up with that sort of mentality. So, and then... You see the illegal immigrants come in and, and they get the money and then they pack in their vans, or as I like to call it, modern day clown cars, and then go back across. Yeah. <laughs> because when yeah. you can fit 18 in a van, you're like, <laughs> okay, where's the luggage? <laughs> yeah. And there are, I mean, it's, it's also line jumping. People have to go through a lot of shit to get into this country legally. And I, I can't imagine that they would be that most of them would be okay with people just line jumping and it's just not and the other thing like i remember when the media was initially uh, and, and look i'm not saying that there are not heartbreaking stories about people being deported there are and it's a tough situation and i'm not going to pretend that it's that there's an easy answer or solution but a lot of times when the media points to situations that they try to exploit if you actually look into them like there was the one example and one of the issues is like identity uh, theft for like social security numbers. And also there is a, um, I forget the name of it, but there's a, there is a documentation that legal immigrants carry. Um, I don't remember what it was, but anyway, th this mother that they had on MSNBC and they were doing this whole sob, uh, sob story, turned out she committed a, a identity theft stole uh, an identity from like a, a a minor and also a legal immigrant and i think my point with all of that and it's one of the things that the democrats ignore they never give any voice or consideration to the victims and i, I i'm thinking like there's no way that the people that were victimized in that case would be like oh yeah that's fine like uh, okay let's you know, I don't mind having my identity, my identity stolen, and, and my life uh, uh, ruined, or at least severely inconvenienced. And um, a lot of times with Democrats, they make the argument that like, oh, you should never um, erase 
the voices of marginalized groups, and I would argue that's exactly what they do in cases like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, a lot of people sit there and, you know, like you said, the Trump derangement syndrome, because he can't, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like he can do anything right, because they didn't want him in office. So, therefore, yeah. everything he does and says is wrong. And they completely overlook, forget, or don't want to remember that Obama said much the same things when he was a senator. Oh, yeah. You know, about strengthening the borders and, you know, not letting this influx of people come into the country. And they seem to have kind of let that go by the wayside that he actually said that. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, because of this double standard, it's like, oh, Barack Obama could do no wrong and Trump can do no right. It's like the angel and the devil theory going on here. When you, when you turn the page and you look at it a certain way. It's the narratives are so weird about Obama in the media. Like on the one hand, I've I've seen them argue that Obama was tougher and better than Trump on the border, but then they don't the way they do the numbers like he had a high number of deportations because they apparently changed the definition of a deportation. Uh, so if like someone was turned away at the border, that would count as a deportation. So they so that inflated that number. Um, it's like they make this simultaneous argument that like if if they're going to argue that being strong in immigration is good they're going to say obama was strong on immigration but then when they make the argument that oh you should just be open-hearted and let everyone in like obama like i'm like well you have to pick like was he was he strong or was he weak like it's crazy i know it they, they want to praise him so much but it's like they they even flip the narrative depending oh yeah he was really no 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 he was really good he was very generous no 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 he didn't let all these people in it's like okay it, it's the same person you you can't have it both ways yeah you just absolutely can't um and here's that 1.8 million people that are going to be given amnesty and you said at the beginning of the stream it would be probably close to 4 million because they can't track people that aren't here legally. So they don't know how many illegal aliens are here, let alone those that are eligible for right. DACA. Right, because not everyone that, that signed up, uh, I mean, not everyone eligible has signed up. Some people haven't, and, and, and apparently under this plan, they're gonna give them that opportunity. So I, I just cannot imagine like George W. Bush or any Republican president I mean, and and that's what's so interesting about Trump that there have been plenty of times where the neoconservatives or even his base has have been upset with him because they don't a lot of them don't want any sort of amnesty and I understand the argument from the standpoint of like I said previously like on the world stage I do think you have to be known as a country that enforces its borders and doesn't let people in illegally and you, and you can make the argument by giving any amnesty that 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 shows weakness I think that if you do it correctly and you make it clear this is you know one time only because i do i really don't have an issue with giving amnesty to the people in the daca program as long as like we're you know obviously any sort of criminal behavior uh, you have to go um but they have a good argument i mean i i will say even though i, I don't agree with them there they could very well be right as far as that if you do even do it once it could cause um, an influx of people attempting to come into the country, but I would argue that if you if you have good border security, then you'll, you'll probably be able to withstand it, yeah. and it would be worth it, it from a, like a humane standpoint of like kind of because you know if you I don't want to get too much into like because I know they use it as a talking point in in the corporate media like oh these children were brought in through no fault of their own and but to some degree that is true yeah. Uh, I just I hate like how they exploit it, but it's it's yeah I think you have to kind of strike a balance between enforcing the border and being like uh, you know humane. Yeah, and it's it's a very very precarious balance to maintain. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've got uh, Batman from across the pond says from an outsider's point of view, it seems like many of the people who were criticizing Obama are now praising him for the exact reasons they criticized him for. Yeah, especially on this. Especially on this. <laughs> oh yeah, especially on this. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. It's absolutely freaking crazy. Um, they said the framework under uh, the second pillar would grant recipients a ten to twelve year path to citizenship with work and education requirements. So I mean, that's good. At least they're giving them, you know, ten to twelve years seems like a lot of time to become a citizen. Yeah, I, I just don't see how this is in any way negative from the Democratic or liberal side. This seems to be exactly what they would want. Um, 
I see why conservatives, some conservatives have an issue with it, certainly. But um, yeah. I think Reagan, back in the day, uh, grand, granted amnesty. I forget the number. Yeah. Um, but I think, I, I don't, this does not happen often. Mm -hmm. And for Trump to do it, you know, the, 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 arguably, you know, Hitler, the, the, they argue he's Hitler or he's the most racist president ever. <laughs> like he's, or the, I, I've heard people argue that this is about keeping brown people out of the country and i'm like well how, how you're going to let in 1.8 to 4 i know it's not, not everyone is brown obviously but that just it it's completely it makes no sense and there's other parts when we get into like the um uh whether i, th I think it's either diversity yeah the diversity lottery yeah uh comparing it to what the corporate media says about it it's just they're again they're in completely two I, two different worlds they're probably deliberately lying g generally i think that's what they do but um i would encourage anyone like if you're watching the media and you're like confused about this just read the proposals and there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that they don't tell you in the media oh yeah most definitely and i mean it, and the one thing that everybody's got to keep in mind is these are proposals in other words they're open for negotiation they're yeah. open for debate in order to get to the final you know, bill that needs to be voted on because something does need to be, you know, done about the immigration issue oh, that we've been having. Yeah. Let me yeah, see. Definitely. Oh, here we go. The diversity lottery. Pillar three. The framework would eliminate the diversity visa program and reallocate visas currently apportioned to the program. The program provides green cards for up to 50,000 immigrants each year from countries with low rates of immigration in the U.S. See, this, this always is a little... I'm like, okay, if they don't really want to immigrate here, that's probably why they're doing it in low numbers. <laughs> yeah, I, this was the, the 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 one that was interesting. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was Chris Cuomo on CNN claimed that uh, ending the diversity lottery would basically end immigration as we know it. And then when I actually looked at it, first of all, we're talking about 50,000 immigrants over like the 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 past few years mm -hmm. and the key point here is that they're reallocating the visas I, yeah. I would understand making the argument that they're reducing it drastically if they were getting rid of the visas but they're reallocating them and again that completely refutes the argument oh, that yeah. this is a banning of of immigrants it's it's just nonsensical yeah they they just don't want to they want to skew it so much to keep the you know to keep people's hands in the air and you know to keep them being angry and keep this you know false outrage going it's absolutely just it's sickening really yeah it, it's like you you guys can't keep doing this because there are people like us out there going a hey, um, yeah they're lying to you you need to open your eyes you need to do your research you know, I mean, not only yeah. listen to us, but I mean, the information is out there. Or like they used to say on the X-Files, the truth is out there. You know, you, just, you have to look for it, you know. Um, and it's just for those of you in the live chat that don't know what the diversity immigrant visa program is, it's um, it makes up to what it does is it's a lottery. This is the lottery that Trump was referring to in the State of the Union address. Um, the DV program, as it's called, is administered by the U.S. Department of State. Most lottery winners reside outside the United States and immigrate through consular processing and issuance of an immigrant visa. Um, and the requirements are, have been elected for a diversity by visa um, of the Department of State's lottery, have an immigrant visa immediately available at the time of filing an adjustment application, and are admissible to the United States. But also they have this, there are a small number of winners each year who are non-immigrant or have other legal status. I wonder if that other legal status is an illegal alien. They don't make that part clear in the, in the description. Yeah. yeah, it seems like, I guess if you win the lottery, some of the people that win the lottery are states uh, under i guess whatever status one of them i would imagine would have to be you're, you're in the country illegally but yeah. i guess you know they could be in through like a uh, whatever um working w what is that the h1b visa or whatever mm -hmm. or, or here to work or, or whatever i so saw there's probably a litany of of, of uh, statuses they could be under oh yeah there, there's so many different visas you can come into under i mean it's like it's staggering to try and keep up with them all <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, do, you know what the other thing was interesting about this? Uh, the media narrative was that it was outrageous and unprecedented that a president would suggest getting rid rid of this program. But then it, when you actually look through like, uh, I don't know, the past five years, 10 years, there have been plenty of politicians that have been arguing to get rid of this program. Yeah. And uh, it, the, uh, what is the thing here in 2013, the Gang of Eight passed, uh, it passed the Senate 68 to 32, but then it was later, um, it didn't pass the House. Yeah. And then you can get footage of some of these Democrats like Chuck Schumer advocating, I think it was Schumer, it might have been, uh, don't 100% uh, quote me on that, but uh, arguing uh, positions that now that they not only claim to not hold, but that and and it's just this constant virtue signaling. Oh, it's yeah. not just like oh I've changed my position I don't agree with it anymore. It's that no oh, Trump is this is horrible. This is like the, the Germany in the 30s and uh, it's it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean it's absolutely it's just they just want to paint him as such a demon when all he's doing yeah. is is trying to get accomplished the things that other people have tried to do before him and failed. And it's, it's, it's funny and it's sad at the same time to watch them trip over each other, pointing fingers at him and yelling at him. And it's like, he's just trying to do what other people have tried to do. That's yeah, on this, I mean, this is this is like uh, something that's normal, uh, a, a debate over the program and a possible reform of it if they get the votes. Mm -hmm. And then the chain immigration um, is another thing that he wants to get rid of, or at least just reduce it to spouses and minor children instead of sp spouses, minor children, extended family, and you know, and on and on and on to where it's you know you have so many people coming into the country. It's like wait, whoa. Yeah, apparently I, I wasn't aware of this, but you, you can if you if you get in, you can just bring in pretty much anyone in your family regardless of because look I certainly understand and this is the other again the media argued that getting rid of chain migration was the destruction of families and then when you actually read it you're like oh well no the 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 parents and the children would would be in that's generally what people think of like when they think of family or nuclear family they're thinking of like mother father and children um, and and certainly I mean there's definitely I, I wouldn't even mind if they're arguing for like certain relatives, like grandparents or whatever. Um, but there's a, at some point you have to draw a line and and keep it to a certain amount of people. And right now it's not like that. Right now it's you can bring in tons of people. Oh yeah, and then the the chain migration thing. I found there was an NPR um, interview that was done, and they go into further. Um, explanation. So, um, if you want to cut in to say anything, just let me know. Um, sure. Somebody said, um, "Is this part of nation's legal immigration system?" Burnett, who was who is the interviewer, says, "Right. It's the visa program through which immigrants already residing here can bring their family members over. Some call it family reunification. The way it works is visas are granted according to the family tree. Green card holders or legal residents can petition the immigration service." to bring over their spouses and their minor children. And once the petitioner gets citizenship, they can apply to bring over parents, married children, and adult siblings. So just, yeah, real quick there. So from what I understand, the changes Trump wants, that first part, that doesn't change as far as the, the spouses and minor children. That remains, the issue would be bringing over uh, parents, married children, and, and adult uh, siblings. Right. The extended family, so to speak. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the next question was, but what do critics say? And they said, these extended immigrant families like your sister coming over can grow and grow with no regard to who's actually coming. President Trump joins a long line of immigration restrictionists. For years, they sought to reduce the number of family-based visas, and their ultimate goal is to slash the overall numbers of immigrants who come to America. I mean, to me, she makes it sound like a bad thing. I mean, I know people want to come here for opportunities, but when there's an influx of people and these people aren't being vetted very well, you get like the Bangladeshi man in New York. Right. Yeah, like, like I said, I, I don't have an issue with immigration. You just have 
to have a responsible immigration policy that benefits the country and doesn't hurt the citizens already in it. I mean, it's amazing that that's considered uh, on the left a completely radical position. And that's also, I would argue, the policies of a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. Canada, for one, has a merit-based system, which is what yeah. they're about to allude to here. I, I don't mm -hmm. see any problems with that. They, no. said, what is, they said, what is the model they want? It's called a merit-based scheme. It's similar to what Canada has. It gives preference to job training and English proficiency and education. Trump and his supporters in Congress want to cut the number of green cards from about a million annually, that's the current level, to half of that over a decade. So that, that's like a, a transition. They're not doing this massive cut all at once. Um, and uh, like I said, I mean, I, I'm not a, a, an expert on, on, on immigration, so I don't know if, if people have such an issue with that number, but just there's just no negotiating happening. It is, it, it's just crazy that uh, one, the one side of Congress, and, and look, Four years ago, this was the Republicans doing the same thing. Now it's the Democrats. But just no negotiation. And um, I, I just don't think you can claim that you're advocating for the kids, so to speak, and then you won't even negotiate on their behalf with a person that's offering to give the kids what they want. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what it looks like here. And they're still, you know, mm -hmm. pitching a fit over it. They're rebels without a clue, as I like to say. Yeah. Oftentimes. So, so where does the mm -hmm. business community come down in the debate over this type of migration? And he says, the pro-business types say we need more immigrants, not less, especially in those tech fields that depend so heavily on them. Yeah, see, the, now the other thing is that, and I think both, both, you'll have Democrats and Republicans both doing this. A lot of people like to take advantage of illegal, uh, a lot of corporations like to take advantage of illegal immigrants and pay them uh, under the table at wages that are like you know half of the minimum wage um and that's one of the reasons that they advocate for it and then i think you you'll get people who will um be in bed with these corporations and then they'll get on tv and they'll advocate for the kids when in reality what they're really doing is advocating for the further exploitation of people that uh, come into the country illegally yeah and I mean, and the more, and it's like, it's going to sound a little selfish, but the more people you bring from other countries that have something to offer this country in the STEM fields, the less they're in their country making improvements to their country because yeah. the talent is coming here. We need to, to me, we need to use the talent that we have here and teach yeah. the people in other countries how to improve their situation because if mm -hmm. they keep coming over here, they're not improving the situation back home. Yeah, that's a good argument. I, I, I and I think. Um, see, you know what the the difficulty in that is. You could definitely, I could definitely see how you could implement incentives in this country. I think the drawback is like, other countries would have to cooperate, and not everyone's going to cooperate. So it's uh, that's a difficult one. Um, but I mean, I think the the underlying point I agree with. I think that. Uh, uh, it would be better. I mean, certainly there's going to be cases where there might be a shortage uh, and bringing people in for that would be fine. Um, but but I think overall, it, it getting back to principles like that, I think would be beneficial. Um, what do you think of the grants and things for the immigrants that come here to start businesses, go to school and so forth? I think if it's done legally, I, I think it's fine. I, I don't really have an issue with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, if you're going to come to the country and and my thing is more about assimilation. Um, yeah. If you're going to come into the country and be like, yeah, you know, uh, I like the freedom America uh, gives me and, you know, you're going to work and like become an American, then that's fantastic. I think that what I have an issue with is people particularly, it's very controversial, but I, I, I think my, my arguments are sound, is that... You, in the instances where you have like religious fundamentalists coming over to the country that are of the opinion that America's the great Satan and um, that while some may certainly the fundamentals not every fundamentalist is violent but I think there is if you get too many of a certain kind of people that 
while they might not be violent themselves, wh when there is acts of terrorism against Americans, are kind of like quietly supporting it. I think that's the, the, the type of stuff that you, you have to um, minimize as much as possible. I think religious fundamentalism, um, I'm speaking of Islam, um, is just, that's the, that, that's the area where I would like to see um, less of a tolerance for people who are openly um, advocating against the American way of life, like in some mosques. mosques it's not certainly, it's not every... Muslim, there's plenty of moderate Muslims. I have no issue with that. There's plenty of Muslims that come over here and embrace the American way, and then I have no issue with that. But I think that the the fundamentalists uh, uh, is, is what I would have. with As far as any sort of immigration that's happening legally that I would have an issue with, that would really be it. Okay. Yeah, and then, and then there's also, you know, it's not only the Muslims, it's people from other countries, too, because I've, I've worked in several convenience stores and run into, you know, people on construction crews that either refuse to speak Spanish or they just don't want to learn it. And mm -hmm. me being a bilingual person, um, I, I kind of tend to laugh at people or people tend to laugh at me when I go, well, if they're trying to speak English and they're having a hard time, then I'll switch to Spanish and help them unless they sure. tell me no because they want to practice their English. However, if they walk into the store expecting everybody in the store to speak Spanish and they refuse to speak Spanish, all of a sudden I forget my Spanish. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, English. You mean English? Like if they're they're people that are refusing to l learn English, you're, yeah. you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it. That's kind of like. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's like, I guess, like the less harmful. Um, uh, lack. What would you call that? I guess like a lack of of um, assimilation. But I, I I do agree. Like I think that you should whatever country you're moving into if you like the country and you want to move there and it's giving you opportunities and it's a better living than your former country i just think that's kind of part of the that should be part of the deal really mm -hmm. i mean i think canada actually makes you learn you know they ask you in the merit-based system um if you've taken french if you know how to speak french if you speak mm -hmm. it fluently and i think other countries across the world are the same way you know when in rome basically sure you know, yeah, and yeah. people come over here, and I know we have to be a melting pot and welcoming and stuff, but when the predominantly spoken language is English, at least try and learn the, you know, the language of the native country. That way you can get around in it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm going to see here. It also says, the current system does not set limits on how many spouses and minor children of parents a legal immigrant can bring in. It does set caps on married children and adult siblings, and there are also caps just on the total immigrants who can come from each country. For instance, if your sister was coming from Mexico or India or the Philippines, they could wait 10 to 20 years or more to immigrate to the U.S. So I, I guess what they're arguing here is that it's not necessarily if the the numbers uncapped, it's not like everyone's going to come all at once. I guess is what what they're saying here. Yeah, I think that's what that, that's that's okay. how I that's how I take it. I mean, it's you know there are caps. In other words, we get, we take X a number of you know people from this country, X number of people from this country. So once they reach that cap, now there's a waiting list. Yeah, I, I, look, I mean, I just think that it's one of those deals where there are in, uh, resources are not infinite jobs are not infinite and so you, you cannot you just can't bring everyone in it's just not possible yeah it's, so we, you we have can't to have sustain jobs. yeah we can't sustain everybody that comes in here it's absolutely impossible yeah um here is a usa today article which is what's going on today with daca so um, let me see. It says the Senate's rejection Thursday of President Trump's hardline immigration package and two more moderate bipartisan plans left dreamers with dwindling options as lawmakers scramble to salvage an expiring program to shield them from deportation. That's amazing. They phrased it as a hardline immigration program. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. That is incredible. Oh, you gotta love how they spin this. <laughs> My God. It's not hardline. It's still a proposal. Come on now. I mean, jeez. Um, uh, Senator Jeff Blake, a Republican from Arizona, who has been leading Senate efforts to find a bipartisan solution that would provide Dreamers with a path to citizenship, immediately called for a vote on his contingency legislation. Again, this is the Democrats stomping their feet over nothing. 
I mean, they're not going to kick the dreamers out. No, I think I think if you look at Trump right now, um, he I think he has. I think he has Democrats over a barrel politi- politically, and I think kicking out the, the DACA people would, would look bad for him and give them a talking point. I don't think he's going to do that. I think that he he set this up where heading into the midterms, if if the Democrats don't come to the table, I, I cannot imagine. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that all of the people who would be disgruntled about the Democrats' refusal to negotiate would automatically vote for Trump, but I think they could have an issue with turnout, which is what lost them the election in 2016, arguably. And um, to have a situation where uh, whatever part of the base it is, Hispanic, whatever, that that could start to come undone from, from the Democratic side, considering all of the problems that they're already facing, it's just uh, I, I feel like Democrats have lost the ability to figure out how to win elections, which is strange for politicians. It's almost like a CEO losing the ability or losing the the desire. Not that all CEOs are greedy, but that like usually CEOs are worried about their providing profit to their shareholders. They're not going to put other things above that. Right. And um, but it's like I think Democrats have lost the ability to put winning elections above everything else. And uh, it's just going to be very interesting to see what happens here uh, because they're in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like from a lot of people's standpoints, it's um, they're favoring illegal aliens over the people that are are here, that are legal immigrants and that were born here. It's like, how can you favor people that don't even want to be a part of the system? I mean, these people that sneak over here, get the money, and sneak back over. How can you defend them? How can you be mad at them when we want to prosecute them for being here illegally? One, they've already broken the law, that one. And then Mm -hmm. those that cause the crimes, you want to acquit them. Why? Not only have they broken the law once by crossing over here illegally, but, you know, they're committing other felonies as well, identity theft being one. Sure. You know. Sure. And, and there was a poll on CNN. Now, usually the polls on CNN, um, they're usually weighted, like, way far uh, to um, give the advantage to whatever talking point, uh, you know, is pro-Democrat. And I remember during the debate on whether the government was going to shut down it ended up shutting down i think for like a day or two and they were just surprised that the majority of people that voted in their poll voted to keep the government open and and it was just funny to watch them not understand that american citizens are going to vote for their own interests yeah <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we did a uh, we did a prior coffee talk where we went through how much it costs for a government shutdown because people in a government shutdown that get sent home or furloughed actually get paid retroactively. So we're actually paying them not to work. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, this that's um, yeah that was a coffee talk a few a couple of weeks ago. We went through the whole detail of what a shutdown entails, how much it costs. Per day, and you know, and the fact that they're still paid, they're just paid retroactively when they come back to work. And I'd yeah, rather... I wasn't aware of that. Okay, yeah. well, that's that's good at least. So they're so they're not missing out necessarily on money. It would just be like delayed, is what you're saying? Yeah, it would just be delayed. Okay. Um, it says Flake's stopgap measure would legislatively renew the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program for three years in exchange for 7.6 billion dollars in border security money. During that time frame. Did you say that was Flake's proposal? Yeah. <laughs> the Democrats right? are probably not even going to go for that. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not because it's a Republican proposal. You know, oh it's like God. every time a Republican speaks, I'm imagining the collective of the Democrats in Congress sticking their fingers in their ears and humming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's just, it's like a total reversal of first got in office with the republicans but this is like this is just is just at a level that i i've never i mean this this is the, the problem here this is not sustainable for a country to have congress so dysfunctional that they can't even pass basic legislation um 
I mean, this is overall, this is just not good. I just think that if it ends up costing Democrats dearly, maybe that will uh, result in the next um, group that comes in to um, to um, make sure that they at least get some uh, of this done. Um, Yep, and here's a, here, I love the wording in this one. Meanwhile, GOP Senators uh, John Thune of South Dakota, Robert Portman of Ohio, and Jerry Moran of Kansas signaled support for enshrining DACA in law while providing the $25 billion that Trump is seeking for his signature border wall system. They would they, they would they would never do that either. <laughs> they would do none of these. It's hilarious. They could. They're so ridiculous. I wonder if. Trump. I mean, I am exaggerating here, but if Trump just said, "Okay, we'll we'll legalize all the DACA people, and you don't have to give me anything," <laughs> like, I still, like, would they would they even go for that at this point? It's so dysfunctional because they wouldn't be able to use that to. They think they're going to run on big bad Trump being Hitler in, in 2018 in the midterms. Mm-hmm. So if even if Trump gave them everything and said, "You don't have to give me anything." The problem with that is they would have to admit that Trump gave amnesty to all of these people Mm -hmm. in exchange for nothing. I think they would still say, oh, this is somehow racist or wrong, so we can't do it. Right? No matter what he tries to do, they're like, no, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no, mm no. And then I I even saw them argue that um, because people have brought up, they're like, well, wait, what about people who are currently because I I cannot imagine it. It must be very nerve wracking right now to be a a, a DACA recipient, seeing that your citizenship is in the balance of this. And then they were asking, I think it it was either Nancy Pelosi or or one of the other uh, Democrats, you know, what do you think that people who are currently in the DACA program who watch this, do you think there's going to be any fallout if nothing gets done? And they're like, oh, no, even though that, you know, their their citizenship is on the line, they they are happy to put that aside to make sure everyone and because they want to let everyone in. They just want mm-hmm. complete open borders. Basically, yeah. they are arguing that that the majority of DACA recipients would gladly sacrifice their citizenship for illegal immigrants and I'm for other illegal immigrants not in the program or not even eligible and I'm thinking no no way human beings are are naturally selfish people there's no way the majority of them are just going to say oh yeah sure I'll sacrifice that's just not happening with anyone it doesn't matter who is in the program what their racial makeup is none of that matters most people are going to say no I want the citizenship that this program that was designed for me is going to give me and I want what the president's offering like yeah yeah. I mean, over here said after the various immigration plans failed one by one to secure the 60 votes needed to advance in the 100 member chamber, senators left for their week long President's Day recess. Because <clears throat> they get more vacations than we do. Um, it, oh, I love when like major shit's going down and they're like, but we're going to have to wait. They're going to be away for three weeks. Like, oh, great. That's, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, the world is falling apart. They need their three week vacation. What? <laughs> <laughs> Something acceptable. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. I said, it's unclear whether the Senate will return to the immigration issue when members reconvene February 26th. The GOP-controlled House has not scheduled a vote on any immigration bill, including a Trump-style bill from conservative Republicans and the Republican-run Senate's decision Thursday to effectively kill all four immigration proposals dashed hopes that Congress was on the verge of passing immigration legislation protecting dreamers. <sighs> yeah. This is uh, I, this is going to hurt the Democrats. I, I don't see any way that they uh, they don't get hurt by this. Um, I mean, it, they're not willing to come to the table, sit and at least talk and say, "Okay, can we change a couple of things before we vote on these?" It's just a straight no. Yeah, I mean, it was the similar strategy they tried to do with the shutdowns because I think that one of the issues at the shutdown was CHIP. Uh, it was like the insurance program for, for children. Mm-hmm. And the I think one of the final proposals from the Republicans was something to the effect of, let's at least vote on extending CHIP and we will agree to negotiate DACA, um, you know, in a few weeks or whatever. They wouldn't even do that. And then the government shut down. And then about after a day, the polling came out and it and the polling indicated that most of the American citizens that at least voted uh, or at least took the polling blamed the Democrats for the shutdown. And then they immediately caved in. They got nothing out of it. They completely lost their leverage because they saw that it was it was hurting their uh, 
their um, uh, status, their political status. So that's, I mean, that's all they're worried about at this point, which maybe that will ultimately end up forcing them to come to the table. Uh, it, we'll see, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's just when, when that happened, when, when the shutdown happened, I saw a lot of, you know, uh, as always, mixed headlines. Some of them were going, um, Democrats prove that illegal immigrants are more important than our own children. And then, you know, the left trying to spin it, making it look like it was the Republicans' fault. And I'm like, no, no, no. The Republicans actually want to negotiate here. They want to sit down. They want to work something out. It's the Democrats that are, you know, sticking their heads in the sand for no particular reason. And they're, you know, steadfast on an issue that doesn't even have to do with the budget. Yeah. And, like, wouldn't you think just from a strategical standpoint, you'd go in and negotiate and then come out and say, oh, they want, you know, the wall and they want, you know, too much of a reform and we can't do that. But instead, they just didn't even come to the table. I, who who would I, I maybe they've just been in like some of the leaders on the Democratic side have been there so long that I think they've just lost they've lost it like Pelosi I mean particularly if you see her in interviews she's she's spaced out she's gone like I, they've got to get rid of her I don't I do not understand you look at the amount of seats that they have lost under her watch how does she still have a job it's incredible I, I don't. I have no clue how she has a job. Right? It, it's just, and some of the quotes they have taken from her, I have had to read them two or three times and, and go, "What?" If she's incoherent. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, in order for you to even halfway understand what she's trying to say, you have to take your brain out and then look at it, and it's like, okay, maybe it might make some sense, but no, she either flat out contradicts herself or says something so completely stupid, you're like, what the fuck. <laughs> yeah, she she uh, there a couple of weeks ago she was on CNN for like a softball interview with Chris Cuomo and midway through the interview I think she kind of forgot the setup and started getting upset with him because he all he did was like float what the Republicans were arguing and offered no pushback on like any of the bullshit she said and he, he kept doing that and then finally she like snapped and she's like well, you don't know what you're talking about i'm like wow you, you like forgot like you you think this is a tough interview this is like this is the the mouthpiece of the democratic of the dnc like of course they're on your side chris cuomo is totally on your side and and yeah it's it's incredible i think you know they they try to claim that trump has something wrong with him mentally or he's he's uh suffering like the early stages of onset dementia but it, it and i would argue that it's completely unethical for them to do that yeah. um but if they're going to do that then they should apply they should apply the standard consistently and then they should have a look at nancy yeah oh yeah most definitely because it's, it's ridiculous you've got nancy yeah. and then you've got in my opinion after he was you know, diagnosed by having a brain tumor, he should have stepped down. McCain. Oh, yeah, McCain, yeah. You know, um, I have a couple of people, one particular person, uh, he's probably listening, I haven't seen him type in the chat for a while, his name was Mitch. He said, we don't need term limits, we need competency tests. <laughs> yeah, oh, that would be fine with me, yeah. You know, it's like, here, take this test, and if you're competent, okay. If you're not, well, then I'm sorry. We're just going to have to let you can't run for any more seats anywhere for any reason because your brain is done, you know? Yeah, I would like competency tests, but also uh, term limits, like four years and you're out. I, I think that would be for, for like, uh, Congress uh, otherwise. I mean, th there are some of these people that have been in – Congress for so long, they're so corrupt. People like Maxine Waters that just uh, constantly, consistently getting away with corruption. Meanwhile, uh, talking all this shit about Trump, and um, I think that's that's um, one of the big issues, other than like money in politics. But I don't know if you're ever really going to root out money in politics. That's oh, kind of like a pipe dream, honestly. No. It, it's, it's. I mean, it's, you should try, but you know. Oh yeah, it's it's too far gone to go back to the days where they weren't even paid to do this. <laughs> yeah. It's way too far past that point. And the Batman goes, political office should require psych evaluations. Yeah, I I would absolutely before that. Okay, it's um I I pissed off a stoop when I was going to a community college around here. We were talking about um, and what we were doing in the classes we were going to, 
And I said, well, yeah, in my, uh, my particular opinion, political science is the only degree where BS stands for bullshit degree because that's all they ever hand you. And she goes, <laughs> um, I'm majoring in political science. I said, oh, I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> and I just shook my head. <laughs> it's like, oh, because I've always yeah. told people I vote for the person who bullshits me the least. I know they're all bullshitting. You just have to, you know, vote for the one that does it the least amount of times. <sighs> yeah, I, uh, I didn't even used to vote. I, I was in a cult, and we weren't allowed to to vote. So, the, so the, uh, I've only voted in two presidential elections, and this one I voted. Just because I really thought Hillary Clinton was going to go to war with Russia, and mm. I, I, my decision was simply based off of my calculation that like Trump is the only person that has a shot against her, so I'll give her, him my vote because I, I just need her to be out of office, and if Trump doesn't start a war with Russia, then it worked out. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he's, he's I love him and Kim and Kim Jong Un just kind of going at each other verbally and and his little shot of and I have a button on my desk and it works. Yeah, what did he call him little rocket man or yeah, whatever? Yeah, rocket man. Oh my god, yeah. that's hilarious. Er, that was fun. And I I could hear the eye rolls and the screeches from around the world, but I'm like, come on people, that's funny. It was funny. I didn't this is the thing that's so crazy. His sister comes to the Olympics and the American media fawns all over her and I'm like are, like are you at all aware of who this person is and what she does this is this is almost a level I know everyone like Hitler's been played to death I know obviously but this oh, yeah. would be like bringing Hitler's sister or wife into the Olympics she's like the head of the from what I understand the head of the propaganda department in North Korea North Korea is a horribly run dictatorship like Kim Jong-un is a horrible person mm -hmm. and they are totally just uh, enamored by this woman mm -hmm. and they were criticizing Pence for being cold towards her it was insane yeah I was like um every morning I do a little news show and after you know the Olympics had started up you know I had my news I was doing the news and somebody in the live chat said oh you mean you're not fawning over Un's sister like everybody else I'm like no this channel isn't for that sorry <laughs> I don't do that here. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the left has a has a very interesting fascination with dictators. Um, it's like they will ignore all of the atrocities they commit and argue. Or, I mean, I don't. I mean, I have no idea. You, you said your parents were from Cuba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, what's your take on? I mean, it seems like. There was, when Castro died, there was, like, a lot of people on the left that were, like, sad. And they're like, oh, he was a good leader. And I'm like, what? <laughs> my, I called, my parents called. We were talking about that. My parents were glad he was dead. And the only concern yeah. they had was that Raul is worse than his brother because he's a little more open about being the bloodthirsty person that he is. Oh, geez. Um, oh, so, that's not good. Yeah, yeah it, went, wow. it went from that bad to good. worse. And then, you know, I, I had Ooh. people that I was talking to going, but... You know they were you know they were on the camera and they were talking about how much they loved him. I said five will get you ten. There was somebody sure. with a gun and a script they had to follow. Oh sure. Yeah. So all right, because Raúl was the one during that wasn't he? Yeah, that was Obama was. Uh, um, yeah. Dealing with him right during yeah. like when they were trying to. Oh my god. Obama was god. giving all these concessions to Raúl, but not demanding anything in return for the concessions. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know he was worse. That's really bad. That's yeah. a shame. You know, and um, I, everybody that, you know, there are some people that I argue with and they're like, well, you know, Batista wasn't all that great. So my mom will be the first one to tell you it wasn't butterflies and rainbows under Batista, but at least it was better than under Castro. <laughs> you know, she said um, they had, I think, three farms, four businesses under Batista. When Castro took over, all that shit became state run. Oh, my God. You know, and... <sighs> You know, it's like, how, how can you overlook this? How can you, revi you revise history to the point where none of this crap ever happened and then believe it? Yeah, you know what's funny? A lot of times it's like rich white kids who are like living a, a life that they've never had any sort of struggle and they they advocate for like this socialism and and yeah, they'll put dictators like Castro. They're like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's good that somehow like all of the, all of what everyone uh, who had to live under his regime suffered from it suddenly just didn't exist yeah 
uh, it's that's just uh, it's unconscionable, really. It's really that's horrible. It is, it is, and um, it is eight o'clock. You said you had your show to start oh, warming well, up and warming up. Yeah, for it. time flies. Well, yep. That was great. I really appreciate you inviting me. To great discussion. Well, and, and I thank uh, you for uh, making time in your busy schedule to come down here. And if you want to join another coffee talk sometime, just let me know. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I appreciate that. All right, good luck with your show. All right, thank you. Have a great night. Mm-hmm. Take care. All right, bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, and that was the hard bastard on Coffee Talk this evening while we were talking about immigration and then a little bit about Castro and of other regimes at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and as always, whether it's coffee or tea, thank you for talking with me and spending an evening with us. You guys have a great evening, night or morning, depending on what time of the world you're in, and see you next time. Mm-hmm.